Okay, we are live. This is the Apollo 13 crew uh, that, <laughs> that are going to try to bring in another uh, another Google chat for you all. And thank you, everybody from all over the world who we know is listening. And thanks for all the questions you've sent in. We greatly appreciate them. I, I'm Larry Rosenstock. I'm the CEO of High Tech High, <coughs> and also somebody who taught this course uh, live at Cal Berkeley for several years. And I want to introduce Casimir and also Feroz, two of our people today who are people who both took that course live and suffered through it with me. Thank you for, <laughs> for being willing to be with me again, Casimir. And Feroz, everybody who's out there needs to know, um, did a long workshop today, so he's not choking on something. He just has lost his voice. Even though he's lost his voice, he's got something to say. And then we, we have uh, Kate, who's here from San Francisco, and we have Tyler from San Francisco, and David Stevens. So what I'd like each of you to do, and, and we're going to do it pretty much in the order uh, that I call out, we would like first Casimir to say something about yourself as a means of introduction, then David, then Feroz, then Kate, mm -hmm. then Patrick, then Tyler. All right, <coughs> Casimir. Hi everyone, my name is Kaz Mir. I was a student at UC Berkeley while I was getting my master's in public policy and I have a strong interest in social policy as a whole and with that education policy so I was really excited to take this course and very happy that Larry invited me back. Great, terrific. Thank you. David? Hi everybody, I'm David Steven. I'm uh, with you from Boston, Massachusetts where we're about to get a big snowstorm. Um, I'm having a little trouble hearing um, in terms of my connection, so if I have to ask people to repeat, that's why. Um, I am, uh, I've worked with Larry Rosenstock for the last 23 years. I started out as an architect, um, <clears throat> left the architectural profession after about seven years and became a teacher. Uh, my passion has been in project-based teaching and learning, and I, um, I was fortunate to be part of the founding crew at High Tech High, and after a few years of being there, I found myself getting more and more into, the, into designing the spaces, both for High Tech High um, type of the, the schools that we were developing there, but also um, around the country. And so the last 10 years, that's what I've been doing. I, I, um, I've worked with many flavors of schools. I work with a lot of schools that are trying to do very little uh, or very a lot with very little. And um, I've worked with a lot of schools that under, are under a lot of constraints to try and maximize their facilities and at the same time connect them to innovative pedagogy. Great. Thank you, David. Feroz. Um, I'll try. Uh, hi, my name's Feroz. I don't know if this is going to work. See if my voice can find itself. Um, I am a student at UC Berkeley, a PhD student. Um, I worked at High Tech High for many years, for several years, and I've been a teacher for very many years, working in uh, mostly PBL schools, and now um, I'm doing some PBL coaching and getting my PhD in education at UC Berkeley. Great. And I'm not, I'm not on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Okay, Kate. Hi, I'm Kate Gannum. Um, I'm co-director of KidMob, which is a mobile kid integrated design firm. We primarily do um, design education workshops with middle school kids. Um, I got my master's in architecture from the California College of the Arts. Uh, prior to that, I studied psychology at Brown University. Um, my master's thesis was on designing a primary school for progressive education. So uh, I was pretty excited about the topic for this, this MOOC today. Oh, so you can weigh in on a few things here. That's great. Patrick, my, my, okay, Tyler, Tyler, you came up. Tyler, go ahead. Uh, so my name is Tyler Pugh. Uh, I'm a co-director of KidMob as well. Uh, like Kate said, uh, I as well got my master's in architecture in 2012, uh, in which I focus on how spaces uh, actually affect the way we uh, interact with each other. Um, uh, I've been fascinated with how it can potentially change uh, school environments uh, as well as public space. Great. And Patrick, the man, oh. with, the, the man with the tattoo. <laughs> hey everybody, uh, welcome to week five. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Patrick. So Pat, Patrick's been my co-pilot from the beginning, and we're all go, oh, going down together. Okay, so our first question, I usually identify uh, to everyone out there um, who wrote the question, but several of them are unnamed, so I won't say your name because I don't have it. And I also typically will identify the, uh, the state or country from which you're calling from. And the first question, by the way, these questions get ranked. Um, by all of you uh, in terms of popularity, so that's where they're coming from. Uh, can you talk about maker spaces in schools and what you've noticed and or experienced so far about them? And I'm going to look to David and I'm hoping that maybe someone from Kid, uh, Kid Mob will contribute something after that. Okay, um, well let's see, where can I start? Um, uh, I guess the notion of makerspace is relatively new for me just in the last few years, more specifically looking at, okay, a, f a makerspace. Before that, I guess I would have, I heard a lot about fabrication labs or fab labs and um, so, or engineering labs or in our sort of roots at a vocational, uh, in a vocational setting, um, all the technology labs. So. I think of makerspaces as having many, many different flavors, um, and of course, um, there's there's technology that's involved. There's there's um, flexible furniture. There's enough space to move around. There's storage for all the materials you need, um, and um, and there's uh, sort of the ability to adapt the space uh, or maybe have different zones within it to. Um, to facilitate lots of different types of um, of, of work, of hands-on work. Um, I also think of makerspace as the D school at Stanford, where so many there's so many moving parts and and lots of places to write down ideas and and lots of ways to um, to sort of transform the space. More recently, I've been thinking, and I think this is when we think about a school like High Tech High and the and learning environments that support the program at High Tech High, it's, it's more like a, the idea of a maker campus, not just a maker space. It's not just one space that, that sort of facilitates that maker and design thinking, but, um, but a whole combination of elements within a variety of learning environments where you have varied spaces, where you have the ability to transform um, environments, move furniture around, um, and, um, and adapt to lots of different types of um, uh, teaching and learning modes. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. And I, I would also add, before moving over to, to uh, Kid Lab folks, that uh, I taught carpentry for 15 years. And um, of course, that's a maker space. I often have wished that I had taken a photo of all of the remarkable things that I saw students make. And that was in the oldest vocational school in the country, Range Tech, which opened in 1888. And I remember, as David might, Fred Perry, who could do mm -hmm. anything, anything with metal at all, and all of the remarkable things that were done there too. So, like a lot of ideas that we all have, like project-based learning, a lot of them are really old ideas that we're essentially um, revisiting. I visited a school in another country that is becoming co-ed and in becoming co-ed to make room for the other gender they were taking out all of their fab shops, their fabrication shops and, and they wanted to kind of be project based and it was really kind of difficult to watch all of these great uh, greatly equipped shops be uh, dismantled. Um, okay, oh, wow. Kate, Kate or Tyler would you like to take a shot at this question of uh, maker spaces <laughs> in schools and what you've uh, experienced or noticed? Yeah, um, I think I'm on mute now. Am I not? Okay. You're good. Okay. Um, yeah, I think from KidMob's perspective, it's been interesting because across the board, we see a lot of integration and a desire to in integrate the idea of makerspaces within the educational system. Oftentimes, they don't know how to do that, first of all. And then second of all, it's not a full integration in a way that they're looking at integrating into the curriculum as well as, like, the overall, like, pedagogy in the field of the school. So I think that puts it in a kind of a difficult place right now where it's something that's sought after and talked about and wanted but also not ha known how to actually integrate into the classroom. We've had a fortunate experience where we worked with a school um, doing our workshop model in which we actually 
were given one classroom. We gutted that classroom, and then we allowed the students act to actually design out what that makerspace actually looks like. So they decided everything from the table locations to where things, uh, where the tools were put, how things were accessible, what kind of materials went in there, things like that. What was really exciting is you can take an old school framework, which is an uh, empty box basically, and you don't need to retool that towards like a heavy duty shop or anything like that, but you can actually get accessible tools and things like that uh, and put those into a classroom. Then the next step is working with the teachers of the integration of actual making and how to think about making in project-based learning and how to integrate that into their curriculum. Terrific, thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in there? I could I could add one more one or two things that I that have occurred to me just based on what you guys have been saying, um, and that is I think that that what I've noticed is um, in terms of thinking about this maker campus and and the kind of integrative thinking that that needs to happen that a lot of times it's around adjacencies of spaces that create the sort of the environment or the possibility for that integration to take place. So just placing. Uh, a sort of a project room where you can get messy next to a science classroom or a math classroom or an English classroom opens up a lot of possibilities for that kind of integration to take place. And, and one other element too is that in any maker space or maker campus you want to see a lot of display and exhibition because it's all about visible learning as well and the sharing of ideas so you want those ideas to be really kind of palpable and have lots of venues for display. Great, very good. Okay, thank you. The next question is um, uh, from an unnamed person as well. Most new schools have to take any space that they can get, usually a subdivision of an old school. What would you do to make the best of this situation? And I think that David was going to leave, but I want to just say one thing about that because I talk to a lot of people who are looking at just from the scratch what to do and I always urge people to get old warehouses if possible uh, because having height and light and, and having the structure of the building be revealed to children uh, just like uh, kids museums now do is really very helpful so they sort of the, they understand in the maker space how the space was actually made by making it plain and making it visible so David um, who's going to comment on this question about taking any space that's within an existing school. Sure, and that's that's definitely the position that a lot of schools and a lot of charter schools in particular find themselves in, um, trying to sort of do more with less. Um, uh, when I, I did a bunch of work in the Los Angeles public school system with some very large high schools where we were trying to create more of a sense of small learning communities and less anonymity, and I think there are certain elements that that really, um, I think, make for the creation. What you want to do is create a learning environment that has a sense of cohesion, that has a sense of identity, and, and, and that ultimately students and teachers feel real ownership over. So um, the elements that go into that kind of space, and I think you can do this in, in whatever kind of collection of spaces you have, you want to have some kind of um, real sense of entry and greeting you want to have some kind of gathering space where where community can be built, at, which feels like sort of the center or intellectual hub of the school. Um, you want to have co-location of, of classrooms where teachers are working with similar cohorts of kids so that you have um, sort of a, the ability for, for that kind of natural integration to take place. Um, a couple of other elements that you want to maximize in whatever space you're in is if you have transparency, being able to build in views um, so that people can kind of uh, have a, a sort of a sense of passive um, sort of supervision of kids but also just knowing and being known. Um, then back to the display and, and, and also I think building in an opportunity for students and teachers to, to customize an environment whether it's building murals or you know creating public art displays or displaying the projects that they're working on. So those are all elements I think that go into making for a cohesive kind of sense of small learning community and and you know I think you can create them and I've seen that very successfully done in some some pretty subpar buildings. 
Uh, thank you, David. Casimir went to a very interesting school named Lick Wilberding, which nobody believes, but that is its name. And Casimir, can you share with us um, what were the what were the names of those different um, shop areas? Because as I recall, they're named after materials in particular. Uh, what were those, and what happened there? Yeah, so it's actually really nice that Lick Wilberding is built on multi levels. So you actually have the library, which is elevated about a few uh, stories. You have the main area where you have the gym, cafeteria, and then you have the sub level where you have the shops. And the shops you had wood shop, metal shop, jewelry, and glass. And these are industrial grade facilities. Professionals use them as well. And we actually, as freshmen, you get exposed to all the different shops. And then by your sophomore year, uh, when I was there, you got to sort of specialize. And I decided to specialize in wood because I was really interested. But you got hands-on experience in all the different shops. And in the end, we actually built a, a box that incorporated um, all the different elements. So we had the wood of the box, we had the windows and the glass uh, lid, and a metal stand. We made jewelry to go inside of it. So it was actually a really comprehensive project that exposed all the students to the various shops. Yeah, that I, I what I particularly like about uh, what you did there with Al Adams, a good friend of mine, the former head of the school, is that the shops were named after the material, uh, w which yes. is kind of unique in my experience of, of such schools, rather than the tools or rather than the occupation. Uh, it was yes. really quite good. Okay, anyone else on that? Or I'm going to move on. And it looks like seeing none. I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, so, what about the um, um, this this question of repurposing old old vocational schools and what have you seen done well in, in that way? I mean, I don't know if we've seen too much of that, Dave. I mean, like Tyler is sitting there with, uh, and he's got a maker space right behind <laughs> him, you know. Uh, what was that space before, Tyler, and what are you doing in there these days? Can you give us a sense of the range of things that you're cooking up there? Yeah, so this facility used to be an old warehouse, basically, in downtown, or Mission District of San Francisco. Now it's converted into part of it. It's an office space for tech companies. I have a fabrication company in here. Then there's a design firm as well. Um, so make anything from wood, metal, uh, just did resin casting, things like that. So the flexibility of in one space is pretty amazing. Um, coming from CCA, so California College of Arts is in an old Greyhound Depot, so it's just this massive open space warehouse with beautiful windows all the way across, massive open doors, like absolutely beautiful space. Going to there to study architecture was inspiring beyond belief, but at the same time you become critical of those elements. Often things aren't thought about in dealing with acoustics, dealing with quiet spaces or spaces that can be intimate, um, because oftentimes the the addressing, uh, designers address those spaces with the same kind of aesthetic, which is just a white box we put off to the side for a quiet space. Um, rather than trying to integrate kind of a new typology in those spaces that allows for an individual that wants to be um, by themselves and not inundated with acoustics from all over the place. Um, Things like that, how people actually traverse those spaces is very interesting. Oftentimes it's long, narrow pathways that lead to larger openings, at least in this, uh, uh, in this campus, the CCA campus. Uh, one thing that was effective in that was the nave, is what was called. So it's a large central space in which exhibitions were held, pinups were done, things like that. It offered a great uh, opportunity for all the students to showcase their work, to be inspired. As soon as you come through the front door, you see somebody's work from, say, uh, a furniture student or an industrial design student. You get to be inspired from these different facets uh, and different uh, kind of industries at the same time. Yeah. And I think that um, also one reason why um, our school space was so effective um, is that there is a really great alignment between the pedagogy of the school and the actual space. Um, I think that that's hugely important to take into consideration that while there are things, are characteristics of the space that um, can be more or less conducive to learning, that taking into consideration what the pedagogy is, how the space is going to be used. Um, an example of that is looking at the open schools in the 70s, how they were kind of notoriously a giant failure 
um, it's been argued, and I think that a lot of that is, has to do with the fact that um, there's a misalignment between the pedagogy that was occupying those spaces versus the actual um, space itself. I, yeah, I wanted to jump in on on that idea because I felt like I felt like when I came to High Tech High six years ago and started interacting with this space, it completely challenged every notion I had about education and how physical spaces interacted so heavily with education. Um, because in 1998, uh, the school that I went to in high school built a brand new facility, but it was based on the same floor plans that all sure. public schools are built upon. And the behaviors in the students really didn't change all that much. We had less students than the t students that I taught at High Tech High in Chula Vista. We had 600 students at that school. And at my high school, we had around four or 500. But there was only, there was a very small college going rate. There was a very small, like, there was a lot of violence. And I felt like a lot of that, after I worked here for a little while, just had to do with the fact that we were all put into these anonymous kind of numbered rows in in classrooms where we weren't seen we were shifted from classroom to classroom but like a lot of that you could become anonymous even though there was a small student body there because you were physically unable to be seen by by somebody um, mm -hmm. there was ways of hiding and, it, and I feel like at high tech we yeah we have a lot of open spaces which you know a lot of teachers when they came in were really afraid of because they were told like what if a gunman comes to the school like with the recent shootings and whatnot but but the inverse is is that there's a lot more places to hide which means there's a lot more students that can get by us um, and not be known at our schools if if they're if those spaces aren't open okay. Good. I'm going to move on unless, okay, nothing from anyone. Okay. So what the next question is interesting. <clears throat> Since most of us might only get one shot at designing a space, what sorts of spaces were in the original High Tech High that you thought would get a lot of use that do, do not now? What sorts of spaces were more popular than you thought? And that's from Tom in New Hampshire. And Tom, you know, Patrick's from New Hampshire, and there's only five people from New Hampshire, so he's really glad to hear from one of them. Um, well, we had a big space that we still have that I'm looking out at called the Great Room, because the original High Tech High, Tom, was in a very, very big, is in a very, very big warehouse that's 39,000 square feet with sawtooth skylights that are north facing, very important because we never get direct sunlight, it's always indirect, like artists prefer. And um, and we have, just to give you an example, there are 39,000 square feet, and David, how many square feet per kid as a rule of thumb? Could you say a, what? how many square feet should a school, do schools usually have? Do you know, David? I'm sorry. I'm. I was. How many, how many you're, I'm missing a lot of what you said. Are you asking for the square footage per student? How, no. How many square? F yeah, per student typically in the United States. Okay. Uh, uh, tip, you know, a lot of school districts are designing at about 160, 175 square feet per student. Okay. So basically, we this is 39,000 square feet. So so therefore, we should have you know. Uh, just a, a few, very small number of hundred students, right? So two, th 250 maybe. We've got 599 kids in here right now, and it's very, very calm and very, very purposeful. The reason we have that many is because of uh, the w sort of a freeze in funds in California since 2007. So we've survived by having more more kids. If you were here during the day, it feels very calm to you, and. If, it were, if the ceilings were 10 feet tall, they wouldn't work. The fact that even though everybody occupies the horizontal plane of the floor, the vertical plane of altitude gives everybody a lot more literal and figurative breathing room. We then had, uh, Tom, at the other end of the building, we had um, what's now called the fishbowl uh, because it's the ninth grade classroom classrooms with their, uh, with curved glass on both sides. The kids called it the fishbowl. When kids name something, uh, good luck trying to change the name of it, by the way. And um, it used to be called uh, the not because because the big room in front of me is called the great room. The room that was uh, that's back at the other side of the building is called the not so great room. 
and that is now called the fishbowl, but I got the sign, the not-so-great room, which is what I proudly refer to as the office that I work in. Um, so, um, David, do you, anyone else have anything to say about spaces that were created? Feroz was here as well. Uh, and things that don't work, I'll add that... Um, sure. The, uh, that the that the bathrooms are all curated. Everything is curated in this building. We weren't planning on that. Yes, David. David. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm missing about fifty percent of what you're saying. Okay. Um, but I but I hear the gist of it. So uh, I think that um, sort of the evolution of the spaces at High Tech High connect to that discussion about the open classroom. Uh, and and because I think one of the things, aside from the fact that the open classroom didn't come along with the PD, that the professional development that was necessary to to sort of um, support the, the, the teaching and learning that was going on there in many cases, um, it was just a question of acoustics. And what we discovered in the great room uh, early on is that um, is that we really needed to be able to close the door when we wanted to and to be able to give people quiet spaces so they could hear themselves think and hear the teacher talk. I think that's one thing. The other thing that we discovered is that we well instead of having this big open space that was sort of far away from where the classrooms were um, it's very important to have a variety of spaces that are kind of co-located so you have a big space where you can maybe do more kind of a variety of things but located near maybe a small classroom or a larger classroom or a meeting room or a conference room so having those spaces near each other allow you to kind of flow and move move throughout those spaces which connects back to also the conversation about vocational spaces because I think that the biggest thing that I see happening in the transformation of vocational schools I've worked on three or four of them over the last few years is is moving the academic part of the vocational program right next to the vocational part so that you're not separating them so that your so that your classrooms aren't just the related rooms as we call them in voc ed but are connected directly to the to the um, to the academic classrooms that they're supporting very good okay hey Casimir when you think back about the the shops back in um, Lick Wilberding, would was there anything if you were doing differently um, about how they worked? I know they were on a separate floor all by themselves. Was did they feel sort of removed from the academic agenda? Because in a lot of these schools, like ours, we're trying to really integrate them into the the more academic agenda. Casimir, did you hear me? You did. I would say that because Lick is actually sort of known. Yes, did, can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. I would say that because Lick is known for incorporating the shops into the curriculum, I wouldn't say I felt disconnected actually. Although it's on a, a lower floor, we do have a hallway that sort of connects into the classroom areas. And what's nice, although it is on a bottom floor, it's completely open. So I would walk out of a shop, which by the way also is completely open, it's, uh, all the walls are glass, so I can be in wood shop and look into metal shop, I can be in metal shop and look into jewelry or glass shop, so I got to see my classmates um, make and create different things as well, but also when I stepped out of the shop, I actually did not feel confined because it was completely open space. So I actually felt that it was structured very nicely to um, bring in both creativity as well as connected to the open curriculum. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay, I'm going to go on to the next question, which is, thank you, Kazmir, from Dan, who is in Philadelphia. Dan, thanks for writing to us again. Is there a typical path or blueprint to financing for facilities? While my other guests are thinking about that one, I will say a few words about it. Uh, when you, if I just had a group down from Washington State and they said when they left after two days, what's the main thing we should think about? Because they now have a new charter law, they're going to be opening charters in a year. I said, think about your building, think about your building. You need a building, you need a building. And, um, and so uh, I typically I find that donors are more likely to give to buildings, just like uh, universities get donors more giving to buildings and to operating costs. Um, so, um, so don't expect it for operating costs, but hope for it for, 
for building costs. There are some public bond financing mechanisms like new market tax credits, for example, where you go to the Treasury website and you can look up, you can give them the address of the building and see if it's just right away, see if it's eligible for those tax credits. So it's this very complicated thing to talk about uh, right here, but uh, I think that that is the typical plan uh, plan for doing it. Is you don't, unlike um, uh, school districts uh, who get bonds to do this, occasionally, um, like in San Diego, the school district just they, we just passed a Prop Z, where there's 330 million dollars that's put aside specifically for charters with with that with that money. Anybody else want to just talk about not just the question of financing specifically in that way? Or, uh, David, you've dealt with this a lot. Anyone else, um, Kate, uh, Tyler, who's seen people and how they've uh, creatively dealt with financing their maker spaces, even if they're rooms within buildings? Yeah, I'll, I'll go shortly. Um, <laughs> one thing, uh, yeah, like creative financing a lot, uh, community buy-in is a great way, either offering the resources to community members for like adult education, as well as private grants, and then um, different types of industries that are have a vested <coughs> interest in the students becoming more aware of, say, mechanics, engineering, uh, arts, things like that, uh, is definitely an avenue that one of the com or one of the the schools we've worked with has found success in. Mm -hmm. What I would say on the sideline too is what I'd hope to see is more integration into the kids, into the actual development and the design of it more incentive for schools to research with the kids to actually allow the kids to actually design the space in which they're going to inhabit for the next four to six years, things like that. Um, I, that's a personal kind of bent on it. But I think the more incentive uh, the school has uh, to go after these grants saying that they're going to invest some into student research and student design, I think the higher chance they would have in actually getting grants or financing for it. Very good. I, w I would say um, just not so much about financing, but in terms of um, creative use of spaces, I've uh, I've seen quite a bit uh, on the East Coast here with the tech bubble leaving quite a few um, uh, office spaces uh, that were that were either newly built or 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 extensively renovated empty. Um, uh, that there are lots of options. Um, uh, maybe not in large city centers where their real estate values are, are, are um, higher, but for instance, in a, a school I've been working with in Andover, we looked at four or five different sites, all of which were uh, had house businesses that, that folded and that had um, great potential for transformation very easily into school environments because um, they were they were open spaces. They they had some offices built in, conference rooms. Um, a lot of them were you know had a lot had a lot of uh, in terms of infrastructure had a lot to offer and really made the whole idea of of, of um, converting them into schools actually quite affordable. Okay, um, you know I just got a question sent in from our own Ryan Gallagher. A great question. Um, how important is the idea, this is going to be for you, Tyler, especially <laughs> since you're sitting in a shop and anyone else after that, um, Kate, uh, uh, how important is the idea that equipment in a space is professional grade? Um, <laughs> it's a tough question. I mean, uh, if you're looking at just the financing of it, uh, it's pretty important to get good equipment that is going to last, first of all, and isn't going to break. Um, what I'd say furthermore is investing in students in the way that they know how to actually fix the equipment when it breaks. Because what inevitably happens is, is a tool will break and students will walk away and never use it again, kind of thing like that. And so then it's on the administration or somebody else to invest in actually fixing the tool rather than getting buy-in from the students to actually um, to fix it, to maintain it, and to care about it. Those are kind of the key things that I'd look for. Uh, you don't have to buy the you don't have to buy Festool like by any means the top of the line the best of the best but I would be very strategic about where you're actually spending your money and um, buy a couple pieces of equipment uh, I would say like if you're looking at wood or even acrylic stuff like that 
Buy a nice drill press. It doesn't have to be a standalone. It can be a tabletop one. Buy a good either miter saw or some tool for cutting. That can be a skill saw, anything like that. And then buy good measuring equipment. And then I would also say invest in materials. Uh, that doesn't have to be run out and buy a bunch of materials. It can literally go to the art store in their dumpster and start dumpster diving for good materials. Uh, that's one of the most important things I'd say that I've seen is the tools are important, but materials are as important, if not more important, I'd say. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, I've got a, another question from Pam Simon, um, and she talks about the funding of the school and um, by which uh, Pam assumes that we are meaning the actual physical space, and that is a correct assumption, Pam, and wants to know how we budget for the internal equipment technologies and maker spaces. Um, that typically, um, we've had some luck with industry giving us some supplies, sometimes excess supplies, sometimes just um, the biotech industry helped us in particular uh, in the early going with one space, and sometimes we just squeeze it out of our per pupil expenditure. But there's no great source of uh, uh, for equipment. Uh, you know, I, I think that when it comes to certain types of equipment, like uh, computers, for example, I think we've learned not to buy them all at once because if you buy them all at once, they're all going to collapse all at once. So you sort of buy them in thirds, so to speak. Um, so different ones uh, collapse at different times, and they're kind of staggered. So um, that's it. I don't know what else uh, really to say about that one, but well, every teacher has a budget. Go ahead, Patrick. Well, I was going to jump into something Tyler actually was just talking about, about equipment. I think it connects to what you're talking about, too, but um, there's two things. Like, I would say, like, especially if you're starting a school and you have a faculty that's going to be working universally with equipment on some level, uh, at our schools, almost every teacher does projects, and, and all of the projects, um, like, need to live somewhere, at least that's the hopes. And I think one of the big things that you can push and also be sensitive to is that people who probably haven't worked with tools all that often when they're coming into the school for the first time. So really be pushing that they need to learn how to use the tools properly. And the teachers themselves, not just the students, but, but I think it really starts with the education of the teachers, learning how to use those tools, and then pushing that, um, but also being sensitive to how scary it is to use a tool for the first time. So if you're a, an administrator who's starting a school, you might have used a lot of tools, or you may have never used tools either, but if you, you need to know how to use those tools if you're going to teach your staff how to use those tools. Um, I didn't learn how to use any power tools until the last six years working at High Tech High. And it was one of the scariest things to go through at the beginning. But what Tyler was saying about materials is so important because now I have a mural that's on the front of the High Tech High Chula Vista School that's built onto uh, aluminum siding that has weatherproofing on it um, because we're in the middle of the desert out there. And it, it has sunblock protecting. But I had to learn how to do all of that myself. Um, but now we have a mural that's going to last uh, for a very, very long time at the school. And it was so worth it compared to a project. And I've seen a lot of them where the teachers don't know how to use the tools. And all of a sudden, those projects get thrown out at the end of, uh, at the end of their use. Um, and it's such a waste, even though it's a great learning experience. Right. And, and we always have tried to have an ethos that you want a project to be something that the student is going to want to take home. Uh, or else it's going to be curated and remain on the walls of the school or in some type of space as an artifactorium and not something that you throw out. Uh, something that you throw out that tells you a lot about um, its relative insignificance. Uh, um, Tom from New Hampshire has another question here. He said that, um, uh, that we've been very focused on the high-tech high model. I apologize for that. There's a uh, there's a few of us here from from high tech high, so we kind of it's kind of a natural thing. And and also for me, I, you know, I taught carpentry for 15 years back east near you in New Hampshire, and a lot of my experience came from that. Um, uh, issues of how to use tools and safety, working with people who had skills that I didn't. Mine were in wood. Uh, Fred Perry, as we mentioned, were in metal. And how, uh, you know, I, I would be the person people would come to if they had a wood problem, I'd go to them if I had a metal problem. And uh, it's not just something that happens here, hopefully, so I apologize for that. But, but you're asking another question here, Tom, which is, are there, are, are there students 
um, for whom this idea is not really a great idea? Are there some other school models that we think could be interesting and might be complementary to high tech eyes? As people consider the answer to that, because David has seen a lot of schools, and I know Kate, you have um, uh, in your work, and, and Tyler, I, I, for, 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 in terms of high tech high, we just had some guests here today who are starting a new startup called E3, and I said, you know. The world doesn't need more high-tech highs. What the world really needs are differentiated schools. We need more people trying new versions of different types of schools. That, that's really what we want. Can someone else speak to um, what else might be interesting that's out there? I mean, there's this, I'll, I'll just jump in with one more thing, which is Sprouts in Somerville, Mass., a really interesting makerspace school. I just was up at, at Maker, uh, Maker House up in Seattle last week. Anyone else have something to... An example you've seen? Well, I'll, ju I'll just jump in here. Um, I mean, I've seen lots of examples of interesting schools. I work with a very broad range of public and charter and, and independent and lots of st STEM and STEAM is a very big focus right now for schools. Um, and I think that no matter what the flavor of school that you have, Everybody is asking the question of if we're going to be sinking money into designing a new school space, how can we make sure that it's not going to be obsolete 10 years from now or 20 years from now? Because we know that things are going to be changing dramatically. Things are changing dramatically. And one of the things that, of course, um, uh, someone like Clayton Christensen is predicting is that much of content will be delivered online and interactively. So what does that mean for how we look at spaces? But um, I think whatever type of school that you're looking at designing, you want to build in um, as much flexibility as possible. Um, you want to emphasize sort of more of a variety of spaces within the school instead of just the double loaded corridor model because really the model we've used has been around for over a hundred years and it hasn't changed that much. A lot of people are just building nicer versions of those those kind of like hallways, double loaded corridors with lockers. But when you put lockers in the hallway, for instance, you really limit, first of all, you make it seem institutional. It's noisy, but you also limit views into the classroom. You limit what you can put on the walls. And so I think that a lot of people are kind of stepping back and looking at, even if we're doing more kind of, you know, we know we might be doing a more traditional program, but how can we create environments that are more flexible? And one of the themes that I keep coming back to or see people coming back to is extending the learning beyond the walls of the classroom. Because when you think about 21st century skills, whether you, you have a more classical or traditional approach or not, it, it has to... Uh, include and involve a more inquiry-based approach. And so that is going to imply that uh, your teachers need to be collaborating more. They need to be modeling that for students. Your furniture needs to allow your students to collaborate more. And there needs to be more of a variety of spaces within the school. OK, thank you. And since um, we just talked about online a little bit, um, uh, um, um, Katerina from the Netherlands, who always asks great questions, has two of them. The first one's for Patrick, and the second one, I'm guessing, is for Kate and Tyler. And, and the, um, the first one is, Patrick, applying the concept of facility design to online schools, how should an online school or a classroom like this one be designed? That's an interesting question. Um, but I, I think one of the things that, that I purposefully thought about when designing this online environment for, for students is, uh, well, participants was, was having a constructivist sense of like how people were communicating. Like it gave them specific ways to communicate as opposed to letting it be a free for all or pinpointing it on being a free for all. Like when I, when you ask students questions, they're talking. And I think that that's a really big thing because when people enter spaces, any kind of space, we all just want to know what we're supposed to do as individuals within that space. And I think when you're designing for that, that, that focus of the in each individual knowing exactly what they're supposed to do, then you have an overall like positive experience for the individual in that space. Um, but you have to do that for everybody. And, and partly, Katerina, there's something that's really 
as a as a long time face to face teacher and now doing it online like last week's class where I was in Seattle you know with my laptop all alone in a hotel room it was really kind of strange so um, so this is something I think that we're all kind of getting more accustomed to okay the next question is also from Katharina another good one so for those of you like like Tyler and and Kate I think but anyone else can jump in if you only had one room in a school or one room that you could arrange a maker space in how would you arrange it <laughs> so I would say again going back to what I mentioned before that the most important thing would be making sure that you arrange it in a way that's supporting the pedagogy, the way that you're planning on teaching and interacting with the students. Um, if it is going to be more project-based, that's going to look a lot different than if you're planning on having primarily a lecture format for your classes. Um, I think the other important things to consider that are often overlooked in schools, I'm actually, I'm not sure if most of the people in this class are looking at high schools or is it any middle and elementary? It's, it's, it's a little bit of everything. So particularly with um, middle schoolers and especially elementary school, one thing that's usually overlooked is um, how things appear from the kid's perspective. You know, if you get down to like a kid's height, what is that kid seeing and how are they interpreting the space? Most spaces are designed for adults and for someone that is at the height of an adult. So um, kids, and the other thing is that kids aren't just tiny versions of adults. <laughs> they are developmentally very different. Um, and that's another thing that's not generally accounted for. Just the way that they move and interact with space um, is a lot different. Um, so yeah, again, I think it depends on what the the type of learning is that um, you're planning for the space and also taking into consideration um, who the students are uh, and how they interact with the world. I think one thing too to add on to that is um, is the fact that oftentimes we childproof things so to speak. We don't want any indication that a student has been in or out of a classroom most of the time and so it's like designing that space, say it's a maker space, that immediately when they walk in, that one, the pedagogy, as Kate was talking about, of the school is affirmed, and then two, that the students have a space, like, that's their space, that they can either pin things up on the wall, that they can, uh, that they can actually have whiteboards to activate, that they can have display cases to actually show things. Those are important kind of elements for a kid to actually walk in and feel comfortable making. Uh, if that's what it's about, if it's about making things, if it's about creativity, if it's about exploration, then the space should actually reaffirm that and allow for that at the same time. Yeah, I can, I can also say that like one of the scariest things in the beginning of design, like a school versus where like say High Tech High is at now, because Chula Vista, I was there when Chula Vista opened and everything was blank. I actually remember seeing it as foundational like a foundation building and we came to visit here and there's this beautiful artwork everywhere and we haven't gotten there yet and it was really daunting but I can tell you that hard work in the beginning to get to push for those exemplars of student work to get up on those walls is so important because when your ninth graders come in through the door for the first time and they see all this beautiful artwork up on the wall and you say to them your artwork's gonna go up there too they, they get scared <laughs> like, they're like, no, no, it's not, you know, and that's a powerful, I, I mean, fear is not the driving educational <laughs> force, but, but it is one of the ones that, um, it, it's because they, we believe in them, we know they can do that, and, and that's a very big transformational process that they can go through, and that has a lot to do with the space and how, how you're curating it. Okay, okay, next is um, from Stephen. Stephen Stolle is in Qualicom Beach, British Columbia, Canada. Is there a school size that makes sense for a school focused on project-based learning? What is too small or too big? While some of you are considering that, um, David and I uh, first worked in a very, very big high school, and um, we we endeavored on several different iterations to make it into smaller units. 
Um, and I always suggest to people when you're thinking about what's a really good size, think about all of the private schools in your area. Why is it that people pay a lot of money to go there and there's usually three or four hundred kids there? And in big cities, the public schools have two or three thousand kids there. And if you're going to, and public schools operate on far less money, if it's such a good idea, uh, to have really, really big schools and you're taking in so much more revenue in a private school, why don't private schools have 2,000 kids? I think they don't do it because it doesn't work that well. <clears throat> I think that, that proves that smaller schools are better because uh, students are known and known well. David, do you want to say something about school size? Well, yeah, I mean, I would say um, uh, I, you definitely feel a difference in a school when it gets beyond a certain a certain size, um, and yet I think of High Tech High and sort of the original building that you're in, the Jer Jerry and uh, the Gary and Jerry and Jacobs building. Larry, is you said it now has 590 kids, yeah. and um, we originally were envisioning about 400 kids in that building, <laughs> and um, and yet the times that I've been there, it doesn't feel overcrowded. Um, I feel like what's what's also important within a school, no matter what size it is, is to create smaller learning communities within that within that school. And so you create different orbits within the school, and those orbits have their own identity and their own group of of teachers and students that tend to have more ownership of them, and use them and and um, and take care of them, and feel a sense of connection to them. So I think that that's I think that that's important. Um, Casimir, how many students um, attend Lick Wilberding, and how did was that too many? The right size, and how many? I people would say. Were there? Uh, yeah. So I had to catch the last part. And how many people were in a shop at one time? I would say the. Oh, okay. The um, I would say it was about four hundred or so, and I remember when I. Uh, was a freshman. Our class was considered a very big class, and their class was maybe maybe a hundred or so. Uh, class sizes were small, which was very nice. Actually, I was able to build a personal relationship with both my classmates and my and my teacher. And they were probably around maybe fifteen um, at most. Uh, sometimes even smaller. And shops, so I would say, probably about the same size, around fifteen. And the shops are very spacious as well, so we have plenty of space to move around, uh, not worry about you know bumping into people. And people are making things from chairs to countertops to tables and things like that. So we have plenty of space within there. And I felt like it was a good size. Okay, very good. Anyone else on that particular question? Okay, seeing none. I think we're about ready to wrap up. For tonight, so we have an opportunity um, for for last uh, last thoughts from everybody. Um, so one by one, uh, please sign off and feel free to toss any pearl of wisdom out there about um, space, uh, tools, use of tools, uh, type of population of students, what type of teacher you want inside those schools. Everyone's very shy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I have I have a pearl of wisdom, and I'll good. sign off. Uh, good, good, good night, everybody. It's been great to be part of this conversation. Um, I think that uh, what I see, uh, what I'm doing more and more with the schools that I'm working with, and I see, what I see working very successfully, um, and it connects to this whole notion of not just maker space but maker campus, is really looking at. Um, at all the spaces in a school that you move through as potential places for learning. And it connects to that notion of anytime, anywhere learning. So learning can take place outside of the walls of the school and beyond the walls of the classroom. But if you look at it literally within a school, there, there are lots of great examples like Marysville Getchell School uh, north of Seattle where there are no corridors. Every space that you move through in that building is a, te is a space that can be used for, for teaching and for learning. And so it's a great way to maximize sort of uh, the, the dollars that you're spending on the square footage of the building that you're creating. Mm -hmm. So I would say just really look at that closely. Hey, David, I'm glad your cat got in the act before yeah. the show ended there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Tyler, 
And Kate, anything, any last thoughts from you guys? And then uh, for Rose, and then Casimir. Uh, yeah, thank you. First, uh, it was fun chatting about this stuff. Um, I think one is like the integration of maker spaces and the integration of making within schools has to be something that's integrated across the board. Uh, it needs to be adopted by the students as well as the teachers and as well as the administration. Uh, and that's a good space to do it. It's a good hub and a physical space to actually have like this galvanization around a community. The second thing is is like when we're uh, designing architects, designers, things like that, uh, designing these, the more integration we can have of the students and the more integration we can have of the, of the community at large, the better off the design will be and the more adopted it will be. And so advocating, if you're an administrator or somebody looking at developing these spaces, advocating uh, for the designers to integrate you on a large scale. Very uh, good. I, I would say thank you so much for uh, having us be part of the panel. Um, I would say that um, keeping in mind that the, so looking at the traditional school pedagogy, um, the culture or characteristics that it conveys um, are focused very much around surveillance, control, uniformity. Um, so be deliberate about the decisions that you make about the space. I think that um, I haven't had the pleasure of seeing High Tech High. Hopefully, I'll be able to go soon and check it out. But um, from what I know about it, the space is very much about exploration and creativity. Um, it speaks a lot about the, the culture and the expectations of the students that are there. So um, just be deliberate and aware that every decision that you make is having an impact and communicating something about the culture of the space you're creating. Very well put. Thank you, Kate. Feroz and Casimir? Um, sure. Mm. I'm going to try and muster something. Um, so uh, flexibility. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Um, so flexibility, no single-use spaces. Um, thinking about wall space, as David mentioned, no lockers for that reason. Um, and also this idea that uh, corridors are single-use spaces very often, but they don't have to be, and they shouldn't be. They are also spaces that can be used for teaching and learning and for displaying work. Um, and I think kids will tell you a lot of what they learned in high school, they learned in the hallway. Um, and I think that's something we can harness and use, actually. Uh, and that's all I have left in me. Thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> and you used yourself up for us. Thank you so much. <laughs> And I would say for when thinking about school design, thinking about versatility, as people were saying, um, making sure it's versatile. Not only that, but um, as far as building in community buy-in, but think about spaces that invites the community in. Do you have community workshops and functions? Are you bringing in the parents? Are you bringing in the surrounding neighborhoods um, to see your school? And I think that also goes to outreach of your school, getting the word out about uh, the maker spaces and why your school is different and going to, if you're interested in attracting a certain student population, going out to those community events, going out to their neighborhoods um, and, and inviting them in into the space so they can actually feel, they can get a sense of what that space is for them. Uh, Thank you so much to everybody, and thank you, Larry, for inviting me. I had a wonderful time. It was great to have you, and everybody should, uh, who's watching this should know that both uh, Feroz and Kat and Casimir, when they were in my Berkeley class, did great examples of, of, of uh, designs of schools which are available for you to see. There's a lot of material there for you to take a look at. Thank you both for joining Great to see you again, David, Stephen, of course. I'll be seeing you here soon for the Deeper Learning Conference. And uh, Kate and Tyler, thank you guys so much. We love what you do up there in San Francisco. And finally, to my partner in crime here, Patrick, uh, with uh, my, my, arm, the the, uh, my arm, the cartoon. Thanks again. <laughs> Thanks for bringing your arm with you tonight, all right? OK. Yeah, well, and I was just going to say to the rest of the students, um, Keep, keep an eye out because we do have, and everybody who's on the panel, you guys should come check it out next week. Um, the students are actually going to be presenting their, their designs for their schools um, in the community 
uh, that they've been working on for the past six weeks uh, as, as a part of the new school creation move. Because last next week's our last week. So um, look for that stuff. It's going to be amazing. That's Thanks, awesome. everybody. Thank you, Patrick. Tyler, again. Okay, Casimir. Thank, Thank you. Rose. Okay, <laughs> bye good bye. night, everybody. Bye-bye.